As a doorman, you might come across victims in your club that have been stabbed or shot or beat up and laying on the ground. In this case, we have a guy who's been stabbed. Now, you never want to remove a, a weapon from somebody's body. If it's in there, you keep it in there. It acts like a plug. And I will move his hands away from it if he does that, and we'll tape it in place and we'll secure it. We don't want this thing taken out. Now, in this case, he was already stabbed and the bad guy ran out with the weapon and he's bleeding. Now, the first thing you always want to do is you want to check for wounds, but you cannot assume there's only one wound. Yes, I see it bleeding, but I got to make sure he has no other wounds and I turn him over to look. Now, if this is the only wound, we do direct pressure, or if it's here, direct pressure. That's the first thing. Now, once we control the, the bleeding or we're about to start our first day, I got to make sure the ambulance is on the way. So I turn to him, I say, go call an ambulance and come back and tell me. Okay. You got to give authority and you, you got to tell someone to go do it. You can't assume somebody's going to call the ambulance. Now, I got to start treating him for shock. This guy can die from shock. Even if it's a minor wound, he can die from shock. So right away, how do we treat someone for shock? Well, I'm giving direct pressure. Now I need, hey, Martin, come on over here. Put his feet up, elevate his feet. All right, why are we elevating his feet? Because the blood is leaving the surface of his body and we don't need blood in his legs. We need it to come back to the middle of his body. Now the next thing I do is, hey, Mike, Put his head up a little bit. We want to try to make him comfortable, right? Now, if he has neck injuries, we're going to leave his neck alone. But he doesn't have any neck, neck injuries. He only has a step. So we're going to try to make him comfortable. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to warm him up. Put a jacket over him. Put it over, right? Now, why do we do this? Because when you go into shock, your blood is literally getting away from the surface of your skin. And he literally is going to get cold. It could be the middle of the summer and you see him freezing, like he's shaking. You don't want him to get too cold or he could, again, die. So you want to warm him up. The last thing you want to do is you want to encourage him. You know, hey, everything's going to be okay. Don't worry. We have an ambulance. It's just a small wound. Even if he has his legs missing, you got to tell him everything's going to be okay. Because what's going to happen if he looks at his injuries? Or what happens if you tell him, oh my God, this is horrible. Well, his mind might tell him to quit, and you don't want him to quit. So this is how you're going to treat someone for shock. As a doorman, you always have to be worried about somebody coming at you with a gun. You can't ignore guns. And you can't be like a martial arts school that all they do is use rubber guns. What we got here is a air gun. It's, it shoots out a six millimeter plastic pellet and in reality based, we use them all the time. In fact, I'm the first uh, self-defense instructor in the civilian world to introduce air guns to martial arts training. Now everybody's doing it and of course it's a great tool. Now what's going to happen is if you act like a, if you act like a, a traditional martial artist or a sport-based martial artist, you're going to get yourself shot. And we're going to show what Mike is going to do trying to uh, do a disarm against an armed suspect. So, okay. Now, Mike got shot with these pellets here. Why? Okay. Well, the first reason is he points the gun at him and as he's running towards him trying to get the gun, well, he's in the line of fire. He's going to get shot and he has one of two things that's going to happen. One, he's going to have what's called a sympathetic reflex. Just by having his finger on the trigger, and if all of a sudden this guy makes a move, he gets startled. When, you're, when you get excited or you get scared, your hands automatically tense up. And if he has his finger on the trigger, he's going to accidentally pull the trigger. Also, if you start running at him, he has survival instincts and he's going to try to kill him. The stupid thing to do is run after someone who has a gun. Now, turn around, Mike. And he's going to start shooting at you and run away from him. Now, he gets shot in the back. Now, luckily, these things don't hurt too bad. But here's the problem. When Mike was here, and we'll do it slow. As he's shooting and he's running away, 
What's happening to that gun there? Virtually nothing. All he has to do is keep it still. Now, this is what we call a no value target, meaning there's no, practically no movement in his eyes. All he has to do is adjust a little bit. Now, the thing Mike needs to do, is stand over there, is if somebody's shooting at you, you want to be what we call a half value moving target, or you want to be a full value moving target. Never run towards someone, never run away from them, Run at an angle, whether it's a 45 degree angle, a 60 degree angle, or perpendicular. Why? Well, Mike, start running and he's going to do it. Go, shoot at him. Okay. Now, what happened was, thank you, Mike, as I'm coming towards him, well, that's a bad move. What I want to do, let's say I want to escape. Let's say I have plenty of room to escape. I want to start moving. What's his gun doing? His gun has to move. He has to do what is called tracking me. The more I make his gun move, the more chances of him making a mistake. Now, if I go half, well, let's pretend you are shooting at me. If I come towards you, I'm not moving. If I come this way, I'm not moving. Now, technically, I'm getting bigger or smaller, but to the gun, I'm not moving. Now let's say you're shooting at me and I'm going half value. Here's my body facing you. But now when I'm like this, I'm offering you less of a target. And then if I run this way, now I'm as little as possible. And not only that, you have to move to catch up with me. That is what you're going to do if someone's shooting at you. Try to move diagonal or perpendicular so you don't get shot. Because if you get shot, does that mean you're going to die? No, because hopefully he only gets a little piece of you, or hopefully it misses. But just because you get shot doesn't mean you're going to die. Um, but if you keep moving, very few gunmen can keep up with you. Very few people are experts at shooting a moving target. Just remember that. And if you want more details on how to survive shootings, crime survival, terrorism survival, Take the courses or watch our DVDs. That will help you in a gun situation. Now, we started off with distance situations in a gun situation. Now, like I said, there's lots to learn about guns, but that's the basics you needed for doormen. More would be better, but you know, we have limited time here. But you might run in a situation where someone sticks a gun right at you. Well, what do I do if someone sticks a gun right at me? And all right, now, here's the basic principles. If someone puts a gun at you, don't do any weird, fancy stuff. Don't, it's not gonna work. You don't have that kind of time. When someone puts a gun at you, get out of the way and immediately grab the gun the best you can. Don't put your hand over the muzzle or you're gonna lose your hand. Now, like I said, you never know how your hands are gonna be because in a real situation, it's not always perfect. He might have this gun right at my head or he might come at me sideways. You never know, so you can't have a fancy technique. Just look, get out of the way, grab that weapon. The next thing you want to do is smash him in the face with it. Why? Hopefully he lets go of it. If he does, take it and get away from him. Now, one reason we push it towards him is because it's hard for him to push it back. And we also want to shock him. Now, I want to rip this from his hands. If he doesn't let go of it, headbutt, knee, whatever it takes, get this from his hands. Then immediately start getting away from him. Now if he starts coming at you, I would pull the trigger. Because I'm not going to let this guy, what about if he's pulling a knife as he comes towards me? He was just trying to kill me with his knife and he's still trying to get the gun from me. So I'll pull the trigger. But what happens if there's no reaction? Maybe there's nothing in here. Maybe uh, it jammed and he's coming at me. Now, use it as an impact weapon and practice this. And again, practice it realistically. Full speed, full contact. Now, I'm going to let Ali come at me whatever angle he wants and I'm guarding my door. And then he's going to suddenly attack me with the gun, right? So you hide the gun and now he comes up to me. Hey, sir, you can't come in here. You have to back off. Okay? Bet you I can. All right. I didn't know what he was going to do, but I used the same principles every time. 
That's how you're going to do a gun disarm. Okay, here's a great exercise for you doormen, and we call this walking the gauntlet. I have some people here on both sides. Now in this case, I have four potentially bad guys, but there could be 20 if you have a class of 20. But these are people who are maybe dangerous, maybe they're not. Mike here is going to do walking through them. But for now, he's going to not know what I'm doing. So he's going to go face the wall. So go face the wall, Mike. And take one more step forward. And I want you guys to face 45 degrees towards him. So face 45 and put your hands behind your back. Now, what I'm going to do, Mike doesn't know, but I'm going to hand maybe one of these people a weapon. Maybe it's a knife or maybe they're going to come out swinging with their fist. Mike has no idea who I'm going to pick. So maybe I come up to one of these guys and he puts the weapon behind his back. Now, I tell Mike, Mike, turn around. Mike has no idea what's going to happen. He doesn't know what to expect. He doesn't even know who the bad guy is. When I say start walking, you're going to start walking. Now again, you want eye protection if you're going to use weapons. You want full body protection if you're going to do some more hitting. But for right now, we're just demonstrating, so we're going to go, go light. Now, Mike doesn't know who I picked. All he has to do is start walking. Once, and this could be in a, any club. He doesn't know who's going to be hostile. Sometimes people jump out and do crazy things. But once they do, he reacts. So now I tell Mike, get ready and walk. Good, stop. And that's it. Martin came at him with a knife, he didn't know, and he got away, did knife avoidance and shielding. Now, if we had many people, we would have tell Mike, okay Mike, start where you did the fight, this fight's over, walk through the rest, and you would go until you're finally over. So once you're done with the fight, go back to where the fight started, and then start again until you're finally at the end of the line. Now, what we could do is we could all, we can make everyone go through this. So now Ronald faces the wall. Mike's in there. He's a student now. And he puts his hands behind his back. And I might come up to this guy and give this symbol. So I'll tell him. And he comes in with maybe hands and feet. And then maybe another guy I give a weapon to. And the moment that person gets on your line, you attack them. Very simple exercise and yet very realistic. So let's try walking the gauntlet with Ronald. Ron, go. Come on! Okay, Ron made a big mistake. What did Ron do? Well, he had the right idea, but because this is a gun, distance is not your friend. He needed to grab, smash his face, try to rip that gun. Okay, that's okay, he's just learning. Now he goes to the next person. Okay, good. And in this case, it's just hands and feet. You can make this exercise as simple as you want or as complicated as you want, but any one of us can do this. And what's the purpose? It makes you react right away. Now sometimes I just have one guy come out and ask for directions. Hey, how do I get to Disneyland? Well, you can't hit everyone that asks you to Disneyland. Or someone might throw a rock at you and we use a sponge. But again, this is just something that's really good for doormen and something you all could set up in your own training environment. What we're going to talk about next is headbutts. And there's a lot of people that do headbutts, uh, no matter what country you're in. Now, I learned how to do headbutts properly from a lot of guys who I trained with in Ireland and in uh, the United Kingdom, where headbutts seems to be uh, a common thing in nightclubs or in pubs. Now, how do you do a headbutt? Well, many times these guys will come, now imagine this is the doorman. Bob here, uh, this person who is my training mannequin, he is my, uh, my uh, doorman. And many times guys will get right in your face, hey, and they'll start screaming. And if you let them get in your red zone, you're just asking for all of a sudden someone to do a headbutt. Now, a lot of times people will just come up and headbutt you right away or sometimes they'll grab your neck and then pull you right in. Basically a headbutt is the curve of my head 
hitting the oval area of your eyes or the bridge of your nose. Clenching on my teeth so I don't cut my tongue off with my teeth and then just rapidly hitting them. For a lot of people that can knock you out. That could really do you in. So you got to be very careful. Now, I'm going to use Mike here to help me. Mike's in front and he's the bad guy. Now, if I let him get close to me and he tries to headbutt me, I'm asking for trouble. But if you do like we taught you at the beginning of this DVD, if you get into an alert stance and he's approaching me, hey, how can I help you? No, you can't come. Is there any way he's going to headbutt me? Can you headbutt me with my hands in my way? No. no. So if you keep your hands down and you're acting macho or you're try, trying to be tough with this guy, he's going to headbutt you. But if you keep your hands up and, hey, sir, I told you you can't, he's not going to be able to headbutt you. So keep your hands up. Don't keep them down to your side. If you do that, you're going to do a lot better. Now there's one more headbutt, and I'll do it on Mike here. And Mike's the doorman, and, and he's being macho, and he's letting his hands come down too low. And sometimes they might play a trick on you. They might suddenly say, excuse me, what did you say? Or they might whisper, what, what did you say? And then they hit you. They, this is, this is a, a, a technique that's taught in Australia. And what they do is they come up and they act like they can't hear you. So what does he do? He leans in a little more. And as he's leaning in, this guy takes the side of his head and hits you with it. You don't want to fall for tricks like that. You want to say, whoa, talk louder. But don't let anyone get face to face with you. Because if you do, you're going to get a headbutt and that can knock you out. And uh, if you get knocked out, they can do whatever they want to you. One of the things you're going to confront as a doorman, if you get into any kind of physical altercation that ends up where someone calls the police, or maybe you even called the police yourself, the police will show up, and if you say the wrong things, you can get yourself in trouble. If you go by the use of force ladder that we showed you, you're gonna be a lot better off because you're gonna know what kind of force you can and can't use. However, um, as a police officer myself, I've been to many situations where I have dealt with doormen. And I've even arrested a doorman or two in my career. And one of the things you got to remember when you talk to the police is you need to be professional. You can't be excited. You got to be calm. You got to be professional. And don't give too much information. If you had to use force on someone, don't elaborate. Don't get too detailed. If you had to kick someone, be truthful. Yeah, we kicked him. Well, why did you kick him? Well, he came at me with a swing. He was trying to hit me in the face with, the, with his fist. I thought he was going to hurt me. Uh, I thought he was going to break my teeth. So I blocked and I kicked him. There's nothing wrong with telling the police what you did as long as you have a reason. If you can justify it, then justify it. And just tell him you kicked him. You don't need to go into too much detail. But you want to make sure you let the police know you were afraid for your safety and that you were using the correct amount of force. Now you don't have to tell them what the correct amount of force is, they already know. And so by knowing the correct amount on the use of force ladder, you're gonna be able to talk with them. Now, a lot of times, the bad guy who starts a fight in a club, maybe he even stabs somebody and runs off. Well, he's not gonna wait for the police to show up. And so you might have to be a good witness. The police are gonna to come to you and maybe you saw the guy run away, and they're going to ask you questions. Well, what does he look like? Uh, well, I don't know. He was a, a white man with uh, blonde hair. Well, that's not good enough. They want to know how tall was he? How much did he weigh? What color was his jacket? What color was his shirt? What color were his pants? First of all, what age is he? You know, am I, is the police going to look for a 21-year-old man or are they looking for a 45-year-old man? There's a big difference. What race were they? You know, were they uh, East Indian? Were they African? Were they uh, French? You know, who knows? But you got to be very specific. Uh, did they have any scars, marks, tattoos? Do they have long hair, short hair? Uh, all these things the police are going to ask you. And then if you see them jump into a, a, a car, they're going to ask you about the car. Now, how do I remember all these things if I don't do this all the time? Now, me, if I see a crime, you know, I've been in, in law enforcement now 17 years. I can be very detailed. I have a very good memory now after dealing with thousands of criminals. But if I'm a doorman, maybe I don't have a very good memory. Well, in that case, 
then you want to use our incident recollection card. Now this is a small card and you could get one by just going to our website www.jimwagnerrealitybase.com and you could order this from us. And it's a very simple card that folds in half. You stick it in your wallet or you stick it in a pocket. And if you ever have a trouble, uh, you just fill out this card and it's very self-explanatory. It tells you what exactly you need to know and about vehicles, about weapons. It tells you what you need to write as far as what they said. And then when the police come, just look at your card and tell them, hey, this is what I saw. Believe it or not, the police are going to be amazed because nobody uses these. Only reality-based students right now are using these. And already a couple reality-based students of mine and instructors have used these in real incidences. I've even had police departments want these cards, like the Los Angeles Police Department, neighborhood watches, uh, people at the London Metropolitan Police in England. A lot of people want these cards because these cards are unique and it's something I designed. And it's something that as a doorman, you, for, you see a guy run off or you saw a fight and they all left. Just fill it out real quick and the police will love you for this. In fact, these are so valuable, the police may even say, hey, can I keep that card? And they book this in as evidence. So the main thing is be professional with the police and don't be upset if the police come and tell you, you know, to be quiet or to wait a moment because they don't always know who is in charge. They don't always know who's the good guy, the bad guy. Let the police do their job, be calm, and when they ask you to tell them, just be professional and speak very calmly and very detailed.